The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.com. Can you see a PowerPoint slide? I can see it. We see the PowerPoint, not the presentation mode. I know. Every time I click into presentation mode, it <laughs> won't let me share it. Okay. Or if, if, I, if I click into presentation first, <laughs> then it won't let me share. So it's it's very strange right now, but um, we're going to just deal with this. I think we can deal with this. We don't have very many slides here, so um, we'll go ahead and go through this. All right. Um, <clears throat> going to do a few announcements first. And um, if you could um, silence your microphones, it would be appreciated through the presentation. We have um, January is our next meeting. We don't meet in December. And we um, have Bernard is going to give a talk on incorporating surname maps into your German research. And then our March meeting is going to be um, by a person named Natalie, and hopefully I'm not butchering this too bad, but um, E. Gunner, E. Gunber, sorry. And she's going to talk about tracing surnames and occupations. And uh, you can visit us on our Facebook page and our website. We have been posting a lot of different things on our Facebook page, so you're welcome to join us there as well. Um, let's see here. I don't know if you've heard about this, but the International German Genealogical Partnership um, is going to hold a virtual conference July 16th and 17th of 2021. Normally, we would have met this past year uh, in person. It's an international conference. It's, it's excellent. Um, I've gone to the last two conferences, the only two conferences that have been in the U.S., uh, they hold, hold them alternate years in the U.S. and alternate years in other countries. It was supposed to be in Cincinnati, Ohio this past year. So mark it down because this will be a really good, this is all the top German genealogy um, people from all around the world. So this is really excellent presentations will be, be here. They also will have some in German if you're, if you're into listening to German. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is um, we're going to do a poll. So theoretically, we can stop sharing and do this poll here a second. And I want to know if you're currently a member of the Dallas Genealogy Society or not. You don't have to be. Just We're just taking a poll so that we can tell the G Dallas Society how many people we have that are... Um, are um, members of their society or not. It's just greatly appreciated. Give it just a second here. Okay, um, appreciate it. Okay, and we're gonna close that again. I'm going to share my screen real quick again. And uh, we're going to introduce our speaker, which is Dwayne Stabler, and he's the president of the North Texas chapter for the Germans from Russia. And he has a great presentation. Um, as you can see here, you can see that, that if you go to the dallasgenealogy.com, the DGS and click on meetings, special interest groups, German SIG, you will see the handouts there. And again, I'll put this link into the chat as well so that you can have it um, when uh, Dwayne is speaking. So I really appreciate him being here today. And I think it'll be a great presentation and take, take it away, Dwayne. Okay, I gotta figure out how to do this. <clears throat> I think I've shared it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Well, 
I'm going to, I'm working off of two screens, so I'll be looking a little bit to the side. Can everyone hear me okay? I believe so. Okay, good, good. Well, I am going to, I've got a number of slides here that'll probably last about an hour. Um, depends upon how many questions we might have during the process, uh, and I will I'll try and keep it rolling. This is gonna be a, a little bit of history, a little bit of geography, uh, and so on about the Germans from Russia and, um, and how that, the term Germans from Russia came about. Oh, I gotta get my screen to go here. Okay, tell me if, you, if this is moved. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm not seeing it in anything but presentation mode. So again, uh, about me, uh, you've already mentioned it, Anne, and thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate you having me here. Um, currently, the North Texas chapter uh, is only uh, a couple of years old. We really were just getting going when COVID hit us, and uh, that's the breaks, but uh, we're trying to do our best through all this process. Um, we are affiliated with the uh, Germans from Russia Heritage Society. Uh, it's headquartered out of Bismarck, North Dakota, as well as the American Historical Society out of, um, out of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And we are, because of that affiliation, uh, members of our group have to be a member of one of those national organizations in order to join us. Um, I'm also the, the president of an organization called the Glickstall Colonies Research Association. We are an independent group uh, we, we're not affiliated with we, either one. Uh, it allows us a little more freedom that, than we would have if we were affiliated. And that way uh, we are able to go about gathering our own information and doing our own research outside of the national organizations. Uh, I'm a member of both national organizations. Numbers of our members are as well, um, but it's not, it's an option. It's not a requirement. I'm from Eureka, South Dakota, a little, a little town uh, that I thought when I grew up, everybody was like me. It's, uh, we were all Germans from Russia. Uh, well, I was wrong. I got, got out in the world. I found out that uh, that's not the way it is. So um, a little bit of setting the stage, or you're going to see that uh, term quite often because a lot of things happened um, throughout history that impacted the Germans uh, that ultimately moved to Russia and beyond. Um, here you're gonna see a series of figures that are all, most of them memorable. I, I'm gonna give you another slide and we'll, uh, we'll name them, but the one that really stands out that doesn't appear on this page is Catherine the Great. She's really the one that I would say is the, uh, the mother of, of the Germans from Russia. In, in so many ways, because she was really the first one to uh, invite the Germans to come and settle in Russia. We'll talk about her in a minute. So here are the people that impacted us. Uh, Napoleon, you're gonna see something about Napoleon in here. Uh, Peter III, Paul II, uh, Alexander I, and uh, well, the guys in the bottom, Lenin, Hitler, certainly you know of, and uh, Nicholas on the far right, uh, was the last star of Russia. Um, Alexander is maybe less known, but he also played a role in what the Germans from Russia uh, ultimately did. So coming back to, to Catherine, uh, quite a, a strong personality. I don't know how many of you are familiar with her, but she's a very, very strong uh, uh, personality in general. Um, uh, in those days, I think the world was run by men um, maybe some, somewhat today is also, but certainly at that time she was, uh, she was a leader in that. Um, Catherine was actually German. She uh, was uh, brought into the, uh, into, the, into the Russian organization uh, uh, to marry uh, with uh, uh, a gentleman that was to become a, a future czar. His name was Peter III. He was, he was the grandson of Peter the, the or, uh, excuse me, uh, Peter the Great, um, who, who really was probably one that brought uh, Germany, uh, some German things to, to the Russian empire, but still was his own kind of a guy. Um, Peter 
came on the scene um, later um, was somewhat of a different type of an individual. I would say he was somewhat simple in his, in his thinking. He was known to have played with uh, toy uh, soldiers and so on. Um, very, um, uh, I would say, uh, immature in many ways. Um, ultimately, um, he and Catherine somewhat came into a struggle. I'll call it almost a power struggle. Sheer fear for uh, her position. Um, and ultimately, uh, he was overthrown, imprisoned, and then ultimately assassinated in prison. At least that's what is believed. Um, how all that came about really isn't that well known. But that is what, what history would, would probably uh, tell us. Um, so Peter, uh, having been, been assassinated, allows Catherine to come to the throne. She becomes the Empress of Russia from uh, 1762 all the way into 1796. A pretty long reign for any uh, czar or, uh, and up to that point in time. I don't know that any had, other than Peter the Great had really been that uh, well known or that powerful. But she was a German and she was a 16 year old girl when she was essentially uh, married to Peter the, the third. Um, she had to change a lot. She was born as a, a, a Lutheran and, and the process of um, uh, going through becoming a, a Russian, she changed to the, uh, the religion of, uh, of Russia, which I believe is the Russian, the Orthodox Church. Uh, became quite quite Russian in her ways, uh, but but I think the arranged marriage of sixteen tells us a lot. Uh, so a little bit more about her. Uh, she's she's the one that really invited the first group of of immigrants into Russia from Germany. Obviously, there's many reasons for that, um, but but certainly she knew the she knew the German people. Uh, and she was comfortable with them. But she, she came out with a, a, I'll call it a doctrine type thing, um, manifesto, um, in which she was inviting people to come. Those people were um, settling. Uh, you can see the numbers there. Um, but but um, as early as the 1764, and those people came out of, of different parts of Germany, I would say maybe further Northern Germany uh, and perhaps some in, in the Wittenberg and, and uh, the Faltz area, but not that many. Most of them came from slightly different areas within Germany. But you'll also notice that the Mennonites uh, came in from West Prussia. So it wasn't always just German. It was also a lands between, I'll say Germany and, and Russia had, that had been settled by people that had already moved earlier uh, varieties of reasons, and we'll talk about a little bit of that. So initially, uh, Catherine makes an offer, and uh, that manifesto was really uh, to provide exemption from military service, a freedom of religion, which meant that they didn't have to change the religion. They were exempt from taxes for 30 years. The uh, land was provided to some to them, uh, and travel expenses. <clears throat> So uh, that, was, that was mildly successful. Then she came in with a second manifesto and that, came, that became more successful uh, than, than the first one. And so uh, somewhat of a repeat as far as the kinds of things that were, were involved, um, uh, but it was broadened a little bit. It was explored a little bit better. She actually had people going into uh, Russia to, I mean, from Russia into Germany to uh, recruit people. <clears throat> uh, the lands that, that she were, were, was hoping to settle, I'll come to in a minute, but that was the whole thing. Ultimately, what happened, you'll see, is that there was a, uh, they were not allowed uh, to settle where they wanted to. They were, they were forced to settle in a given area. And they were also, sometimes they had to change their, their trades from what they might have been. Maybe they were a weaver and they became a farmer. Uh, or some sort of a blacksmith and they had to become a farmer. Um, all of that was somewhat forced on them, not realizing it until they got there. So here's a map 
<clears throat> of, of the area in general. And that far left-hand side is really where, where Germany is. Um, and I'm going to see if my mouse, big red uh, arrow here is going to help you. The area, and you'll see it in the next slide, that they were to be settled in was very far on the right-hand side. And we call that the Volga region. As that immigration occurred, that path recurred mostly around the top half of, of I'll say, Europe coming somewhat by, by boat and then across uh, land. What's kind of nice about this particular uh, slide and it's a bit hard to see is that it actually gives the dates of what, when those routes would have been used. But they came out of that, cent that, that, that area uh, of, of Germany and, and immigrated across that top path, uh, giving them some access via the, the uh, water and then uh, across land. Still quite a long distance. So that's where they were going. They were they were immigrating uh, all the way from an area here that had gone through an awful lot. Obviously, uh, uh, some some uh, time before that, uh, they had gone through things like the Black Plague and and uh, even the Thirty Years' War that had had occurred in large part around this general area. But uh, certainly, they were looking for freedom. They were looking for uh, opportunity. Here's a better look at it, and, and, and people that research that general area today, and those people that uh, have heritage that comes out of there uh, into other parts of the world, particularly the United States and Canada, um, the Volga German Russians typically would, would be looking at this area. Saratov has a, a large archive. Uh, that area has been, I'm going to call that archive, having been mined, and a lot of information has come out of that. Uh, into especially the American Historical Society uh, has done an awful lot of work to get material out of that. Although it's not the only other only area, uh, you might kind of wonder in your mind. You might have if you if you uh, have studied some some say World War II history, you, you see Volgograd or Stalingrad is lo located down here. So this is an area that that later on in history had another a whole another meaning. The Volga River runs, the, uh, this is the river and it runs right here and it runs on up. I believe it goes all the way up to Moscow. And it was known that there were times when Catherine the Great would actually, she had a, uh, I'll call it a boat. That's a pretty good sized one. And she would actually go down this, this right river. And she came through this area at one point of time in her, in her reign. But it goes all the way down to the Caspian Sea. Um, Keep in mind this particular map in relationship to where the Black Sea is, because we're going to talk about that area in a little bit. But this area was was um, was really the initial area where where things were being settled, uh, and and for the most part, the land on one side of the uh, river compared to the land on the other side of the river was radically different. Uh, I believe it was the left side on Saratov area where the land was much more fertile and better for for uh, crops. And the land on the uh, on the on the right hand side was not as good. I think it was hillier and and much more difficult to farm. Uh, as a result, many of the farmers in that area, those areas, they did struggle. Again, here's another image of that. It shows you those those villages themselves. This is a little zooming in and getting a better idea. You see some of these river names, these, these tributaries, and essentially that came into the Volga. Uh, many, many areas uh, along that, that line. So after, after Catherine's reign, uh, she, had a, she had a couple of children, but Paul the I uh, ends up taking over where she left off. Um, he was certainly a better leader than Paul than Peter the uh, third, but but his reign was relatively short. Uh, he came in to the the whole scene in early 1800s. Um, had had his differences than from where Catherine was. Um, I think he was probably less of a, a person of the people, um, and so on. But he also uh, started working uh, against Napoleon. Uh, he was uh, he he was uh, somewhat different. Uh, he was a he was a bit of a tyrant in many ways, and he wasn't particularly liked. Uh, ultimately, 
uh, he was assassinated. And you'll notice that he was only uh, an emperor for about five years. I'm going to change the topic just a little bit away from Russia, but at the, the same point in time, a guy that we probably have all heard of, his name is Napoleon. Napoleon uh, came, came into power actually twice, uh, the first time uh, until about 1814, uh, and then briefly again in 1815. Uh, but he plays an important role uh, in what happens to the Germans uh, that were in Russia as well. Um, he, he certainly was becoming a, a problem when the French would invade, uh, uh, I'll call it the lands that became Germany. Uh, he was known for conscripting uh, young boys into the uh, Napoleonic uh, military. Uh, and, you know, these kids were probably little farm boys, 12 and 16 years old in that neighborhood. They were conscripted in, in many, many cases. They were never heard from again by their parents. They, uh, they were ultimately what I, uh, I call a gunfighter. They probably were put ahead of the, the, the regular troops and, and drew a lot of the fire and thus uh, was, the mortality was pretty high. Uh, but, but also Napoleon at that time was struggling to raise money. Uh, and, and so something called Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase came about. And that's what the, the graphic there on the right is trying to show. And it shows that land in uh, the brown that was the area that, that um, was for sale essentially through that purchase. So that purchase occurred in, 19, in 1803. Obviously, we all know that jo Thomas Jefferson is the guy in the United States that ultimately uh, was able to purchase that that in, that rather large piece of property from the French for $13 million. Now, $13 million is still a lot of money to us today, but it was a whole lot more then. Uh, but but uh, it was questionable whether that would have been a good purchase. Um, ultimately, uh, I think we all agree it probably was. Um, but anyway, that was going on at the same time. Some of these other things were going on in, in, in Russia. So we have to sometimes look at the, the, I'll say the whole globe and, and see what's going on, uh, how, how one action interacts with the other. So uh, back to Russia, a guy by the name of Alexander I comes along. Now, Alexander I was a great, uh, he was the grandson of, of um, Catherine the Great. He was probably uh, reared more by his, his grandmother than anyone else. She really kind of groomed him into this role um, and he became a very successful czar. He also uh, brought about uh, some things that made it possible for Germans, additional Germans to emigrate. Uh, there were a variety of things going on at the period of time um, that he was uh, in power uh, and, and ultimately it opened up some, some lands. And I won't go through all of the things that are on this sheet, uh, but you can see that you'll see things like the Gluckstall colonies uh, was founded that was in the Black Sea area. And we'll come to talk about that um, in a minute. So Alexander again takes, takes his grandmother's manifesto. He tweaks it a little bit, but in effect, he re-releases that. He sends people out to various places in, in Germany, particularly I would say the, the Wudenberg Germany uh, region uh, in large part that would include, you know, some of the areas around the Black Forest, all the way up into the area I call the Faults or the Palatine area, um, really trying to draw additional uh, farmers. And, and the reason for that was that because of some of the wars and some of the things that had happened, the Turks had been driven out of, uh, out of that southern part of uh, what I'll call Russia, uh, and today would be known as, as a, uh, close to Odessa, would be known as Ukraine or Moldova, uh, that general area became open. It also was very, very fertile, super good soil. It's probably uh, later on as time went on, became to be known as the breadbasket of Russia, probably equivalent to what we know of as the Red River Valley in North Dakota and, and, and Minnesota. Extremely fertile land, extremely high producing 
uh, it fed many, many Russians. But he, he Alexander, um, he did some other things. He allowed some interest-free loans uh, and, and to help them get some equipment. Obviously, when they came across uh, all those miles, um, they didn't carry much more than what they could in a small wagon uh, and uh, or on their backs. Some cases, some came down the Danube River, uh, but but it was very it was a struggle for them to carry much more than what they could carry. Um, so farm equipment and so on, even as crude as it was, wasn't something that they brought along. So they're leaving their homeland uh, and coming across in various ways. You can see there it talks about 1,700 miles. Even today, that's a long drive. So coming back to this map, we're talking about, it says Schwarz's map, that means Black Sea. Right here is the area where they settled and I'm gonna go right to the next slide because I've circled that there. And, and so that's the area they were settling and that is opposed to this Volga region that is, um, is, is right, you know, right above um, that area, but is still about 800 miles away. So there wasn't a, an opportunity really for a lot of interaction. Although in recent years, I've actually run across a few marriages between a Volga and a Black Sea German. And I don't think that was very common, but obviously there must have been some sort of trade or some sort of a, a opportunity for, for them to do things. I'm gonna move my camera just a little bit. And now maybe I can I, I can look right into it a little bit better. Uh, anyway, so there were many uh, many paths that they took. There were some overland. There's some that came down the, the the Danube at least partially, and then made their way across uh, our, our, um, a land. But it certainly allowed for a lot of things. Uh, but again, a long distance, months of travel. Um, all types of issues that occurred, people dying on en route uh, and so on. So, so it was by no means a, a, a easy trip, uh, just like the Volga Germans, uh, the, the Black Sea also struggled with it. I point out Bessarabia because Bessarabia comes along uh, as an area of settlement a little bit later. Uh, I think it was about 1812, I have it on one of the slides, is an area where Germany uh, I mean, excuse me, Russia drove people out of that area that had been occupying it. And that became an area that people were settling. So some actually came into that Black Sea area and then moved across a river that runs right here. And it's the name of his Dniester River. And so that division somewhat separated the, the Bessarabia from, from what I'll call the Black Sea region. I keep them separately in, in my mind simply because of the, the difference in timing as far as the settlements. So this is kind of a simplified version. Uh, Neudorf was one of those villages in the Black Sea area, uh, happens to be in the Glicksal uh, enclave. And the Glicksal enclave is the one that I've focused on perhaps more so than others because that's where my, my uh, family settled initially uh, for the most part. Uh, and then certainly you see here, this, this, this particular map shows towns and, and areas that we would probably recognize today. Not all of them I might mention came all the way from here to get to these areas. Some of them already had been living over here in Poland. There's an area called Galicia uh, and so on. Some of those folks had, had migrated that far but never any further until those lands became open and available. But they were already fleeing ahead of uh, probably the Napoleonic uh, military. This is one more map that I, I happen to like and use quite frequently. Uh, it shows the area of the Black Sea in particular, and it shows the various enclaves. And when you get into the genealogy of this, this becomes pretty important to you because as I mentioned uh, earlier, the Gleekstall colonies, kind of the settlement up in here, Bergdorf is very important to me, uh, but Klein Eidorf is where my grandfather was born. And my great grandfather, I believe is buried. I'm a great, my, uh, yeah, my great grandfather, great, great grandfather, excuse me. Um, 
The Kuchagon colonies are a bit different, uh, again, in that they come primarily from the Elsass region, right along what I'll call the, the German-French border, and that border has moved around over time. But many of those people uh, were of the Catholic faith, and they settled predominantly in this area. Some did settle down in the, in the uh, Liebenthal area as well, but that's more of a mixture. Uh, the Beresine areas, again, got some areas in there where, where Catholics settled, but a lot of it was Protestant. The Kuchu, or the Glexco colonies, by large part, were Lutheran. Um, I don't know that I've run into any Catholic colonies in, in that general area, uh, but by the time I say I never run into one, I will. Anyway, for anybody studying this area, it's an extremely valuable map. But notice that there are Mennonite settlements much further over in this area, as well as down in the Crimea. Uh, they called many times I've seen it written as the Krim. Uh, and then, of course, right in this area, you see the term Ackermann. That was an area, a uh, fairly major city, and that was in the, in the uh, Bessarabia area. So this is a little bit better look at that area called the, the, the Crimea, and you see these settlements. Notice that, that not all these people were from um, Germany. You've got a Swedish colony here, and so you've got Mennonites. Uh, you've got other, other areas that were settled by um, other individuals from other parts of the, of the uh, globe, so to speak. Again, more Mennonites here. I've really never got into any of the, the details of the Mennonite uh, settlements, um, but I, I can tell you that there is actually a Mennonite settlement here in, in Texas. And uh, that's something I've learned. Uh, and, and she's actually, I believe, joined our, our organization. Maybe online, I'm not sure. This is an older map. I just wanted to show you the difficulties in, in trying to, to grasp what I've tried sharing with you uh, by looking at some of the older maps. Uh, I tend to migrate to the newer maps because they obviously uh, make it a whole lot easier for me, but, but this is an older map. I think it, it dates from pre-1900. Um, so when they were in these areas, I, I guess I wanna talk a little bit because so many of them were farmers. I wanna talk a little bit about what and how they lived. Uh, they were given a certain uh, amount of land and the term for that land that they got there is not an acres, it was called decidine. And I believe one decidine is about two thirds of an acre if I recall. Uh, but anyway, they, they typically lived in small villages or dorfs and they would then go out into the, into the country and they would, uh, they would do their, their farming. Uh, the, the, Typical plan there really kind of shows you what a particular yard might look like. Uh, many of these farmers did have their own orchards. They got obviously got some from fruit from that, uh, but they also did quite a bit of uh, raising of, 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 of vineyards, vines, and would make their own wine and, and so on. They were pretty much self-sufficient in many ways and that they had, uh, you know, they typically had chickens and cows and all that stuff and they had that all located right here and there would be another one you know next door to them that would probably uh, mimic this one but it's a very interesting way of looking at how they live and and then thinking about forward to when they finally ultimately did come to the united states and how different they've had to have had to farm here because there they had and, and in the united states you had to live on the land you didn't live in town and go out to the land and, and work it. This is just a, a typical picture of uh, Tarantino, which is part of Bessarabia. It was one of the major towns uh, in doing some work with some of my, my families that settled in that area later. Uh, coming out of Bergdorf in the Glickstall area, they settled in, in, uh, in Hoffnanstall was the name of the town, but it wasn't that far from Tarantino. And uh, they, they, this shows just a, a village scene. So just kind of as a recap, you know, I just wanted to kind of step back a little bit and kind of put everything into focus. Uh, so you've got a great wave of migration that happens. I'm gonna say, you know, 
certainly the Volgas were, were more in the, in the 1700s, late 1700s, but then in the early 1800s is when you see this migration, second migration as a result of uh, uh, and, uh, Alexander the first, and you see a great deal of, of, of uh, migration. People came in masses, they settled areas, they expanded, uh, their, their mother colonies got too big, and then what happened is uh, they would develop what was called daughter colonies, and those daughter colonies uh, grew as well, but typically were smaller uh, areas, would be located closer to the land that they could, they could work and so on. But there were some pretty you know, tough times. Um, you know, I mentioned there that uh, you know there were different wars, and 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 in 1833 there was actually a a, a very hard famine that, that affected many people. Um, there just were no crops. So uh, by you know by by 1835 things started to change, as as you had uh, a new czar coming on. Uh, and, and they started to, I'll say, clamp down a bit further on, on these, uh, these, these Germans that were essentially uh, used to speaking their own language, teaching their children in, in German in their own schools, and operating fairly independent from, from the Russians. That's not to say that they didn't uh, learn some Russian. They had to, to certainly do some trading with the Russians. Uh, the Black Sea folks certainly did a lot of that with areas and a, a, a seaport uh, city name called Odessa. And, and so there was some uh, mixture of cultures that way. But by, by 1835, things started changing and that started to get people to, change, to think about it. There was an early group that uh, started to look elsewhere in 1849 and very last bullet there uh, you see that there were a group of 83 men women and children that embarked and came to New York City and then ultimately ended up in I'm going to and say mostly in that Cleveland area Lake Erie area Sandusky is if you read something about this it'll often be referred to as Sandusky and those people became wine growers obviously having had that experience in in Russia, growing uh, growing crops, but also growing wine vineyards and having uh, the ability to produce wine uh, seemed to be a good fit for them, and probably the soil was absolutely excellent for that. I might mention too that uh, earlier in the history of the U.S. Uh, there had been quite a large immigration of Germans that came into, um, into Pennsylvania and that area. Uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch, you all know, are not Dutch. Um, and, and so perhaps one of the thoughts I've had is there was maybe some connection there. And that was one of the reasons that they would come into that general area to, to settle um, and, and see how life could be for them. Back in Russia, you have a new guy called Alexander II that came on. He was not, I'll say he wasn't a, a, a bad uh, czar. <clears throat> Certainly they had had worse. But uh, he, he's an important historical figure, but he's certainly not a, a, great, uh, a great czar like, like uh, uh, Alexander I had been. <clears throat> but he was, he was, in many cases, he was not liked. Uh, and, and ultimately, because of some of the control that he was, he was pushing and so on, he was uh, essentially assassinated again um, through a bombing. Um, you, see, you see a lot of violence in that regard uh, with, with some of the, the, the folks that lived at that time. While all that was going on and people were getting restless in some cases, thinking about getting out and you had the success of these folks that went to Sandusky and certainly they were communicating back to uh, their, their friends and relatives in, in Russia. Uh, about that time, there were opportunities in the United States. <clears throat> you will remember that the railroads were, were pushing westward. And in, and in some cases, those railroads wanted to see the population grow and they saw opportunities. And so those railroads worked to, to, to improve the population, I'll say, from say, say the Mississippi 
further further west. And <clears throat> you have this company called Messler that comes along and they deploy agents from uh, the United States, probably some that were hired in Europe as well, but they were deployed into places in, uh, in Russia. And their goal was to try and get people from there to consider immigrating to the United States in particular. <clears throat> so there you have Kaiser Schiff right here, means ship. And, and they were looking to uh, bring people out of places like Russia into the United States uh, and have them settle somewhere here in the United States or uh, actually later on beyond. So about that time, um, some of these things that were going on, um, my grandfather happened to, or my great, excuse me, my great grandfather happened to be a young man and the military freedoms of um, ser serving in the military had been taken away. And lo and behold, my great grandfather ends up, I believe getting conscripted into the, into the Russian army. I never have been able to find any records about that at this point in time, but that's not something that I'm gonna give up on. Uh, this is a picture of him you see on the right hand side uh, in a military uniform um, and I have a little bit of information about what some of those em emblems and insignias means. But essentially, he was, uh, he was, I believe, probably taking care of the Tsar's horses or the Tsar's army's horses, not necessarily for the Tsar directly. The picture on the very far right-hand side, lower right side, is the first time I'm showing this picture, I believe, is, is today. This is a picture of my great-great-grandfather, who, who, who did not ever come to the United States. I believe he died in Klein Eidorf, although I cannot prove that, uh, but that's where my, my great-grandfather immigrated from. And I know in 1900, my, my great-grandfather went back to Russia uh, because I found the ship's records of him coming back into the United States. Uh, by that time, he was an American citizen and my great-great-grandfather died about five years after that period of time, four or five years after that. So my belief is he went to Russia perhaps to try and convince his, uh, his father and his stepmother by that time, his, his mother had passed away uh, to come back to the United States. On the ship's manifest, I've not been able to identify the fact that he's, he's ever left the country. I believe he, he died in that country uh, probably because he felt he was too old to start over. But the, they certainly went through some very difficult times. 1892, uh, hard famine again, and um, and so on. So by 1904, uh, the uh, Russian-Japanese War uh, was in place, and by that time, some of the Germans from Russia men were serving in that military. I believe my wife's uh, grandfather was one of those that, that did serve there because I know he was in the military and he came in 1905 to the United States. So you've got some things going on that were difficult for the Germans uh, that were living in Russia at that time. And so there were reasons to want to get out. Where to go? Well, you remember back we were talking about the uh, uh, Napoleon and, and the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase. Well, guess what? That land just happened to be open and available for settlement. It was an area where, where railroads were pushing uh, west from um, the Mississippi. And uh, so land became available for homesteading. And that area within that circle was an area where I would say would be the most, uh, most common area for them to settle. Uh, Kansas and Nebraska would be the first where many of the Volga Germans who came earlier than the Black Sea Germans would settle. And, and, uh, and so you see a, a large population of them in, in that general area, uh, as well as, as uh, say, nor uh, Oklahoma, particularly Northern Oklahoma. Some of our members uh, have, have families that come from that area and they tend to, to be more uh, from the Volga general area. Um, <clears throat> South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, I would say are predominantly Black Sea 
they came a little later. And of course, if you think about the homesteading of the United States, it kind of worked from the bottom up. And so uh, things happened. Um, South Dakota, North Dakota became states in 1889. So uh, those areas were, were being settled, but they were somewhat being settled from that bottom uh, area down in this region up. But they also did settle in a northern section of the Panhandle. And we're going to look at that for just a little bit because it's been something of interest to me since I've been in Texas. They settled in an area here. And some of you that are from Texas will recognize those town names. Um, and and um, predominantly the area where, where they would have settled. Many of them I know did move uh, later on, left those areas, but I believe a lot of them probably came in from different parts of Oklahoma and then settled that as that land became available. My, my goal is to at some point in time understand that area better and maybe write an article about it for our newsletter. But uh, I haven't uh, pursued that too much in the last few months. If you were to do a Google map, that's what it's going to look like uh, in those towns that you would see that today. I have friends that have relatives in this area, and I don't know that any ever got over to this far over to the Dalhart area, but this general area is where they settled. So what did they do in the United States? Well, they farmed. What else did they know? Now, certainly some of them became merchants and so on. But on the prairie, uh, and this was virgin soil, uh, they were given an opportunity to, to get land uh, through the uh, Homestead Act and they, they homesteaded. Uh, some of these pictures are predominantly from the Dakotas, although the one on the far right hand side is Nebraska. Those are sod houses, usually with a grass type roof or that we'll call it a thatch roof. And that's what they lived in. Many of them started out pretty meager. Some of them, the, 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 the whole building would get larger and they would actually have one end of it would be a barn and maybe in between is where they kept their grain or so on because of the harsh winters, they had to keep their animals indoors. Um, as time went on, obviously they, they graduated from using oxen to using horses and ultimately to the steam engine. And they were breaking the uh, sod here with, with big um, plows that uh, would obviously break that sod. And as they continued on, they, they, they did better. Um, picture in the upper, usually in this presentations, I would ask what anybody thinks these pictures are. But I, because I can't ask you so easily today, I'm just going to tell you. Um, this is a baler. That's an early version of a hay baler. And you see those on the sides. Again, drawn by a, a steam threshing me uh, with a uh, uh, pulley on here. Again, this is the traditional steam thresh threshing machine you see. Um, this happens to be of my great grandfather, the one that emigrated on his, uh, with his steam rig in uh, near Eureka, South Dakota. Um, anyway, that, that I believe is him on top of here. He had a crew and he would go around I'll call it custom combining, much like what they do today, except in a much smaller area. This picture in the lower left is pretty unusual. Most people don't guess what it is. What it is, is this is drilling a water well. And this is the, the bucket that would go in and they would drill a water well down here to, to get water for the, for the farm. Not all were successful at doing that. Sometimes they'd have to drill more than one uh, well, either because they hit a dry spot or maybe they hit a rock some, so many feet down. Uh, the depth of wells would vary quite a bit. I'm, I'm used to them being about 100 feet deep, uh, but I also heard of some being as deep as 200 feet. Um, so quite a long stretch down, all that dirt had to be brought up, uh, emptied. And you can see here, this horse is actually doing the horsepower to drive that. This again is a, a threshing crew. I just thought it was a pretty a cool picture. In fact, I think it's on the, uh, uh, either on the website or the Facebook page for us. And uh, that's where it came from. I, said, uh, I, I wanted to share that picture because I think it's rather interesting to see how these folks were working and, and pretty proud of what they were doing. 
Now, obviously, when they settled in the area, uh, they met some hard times as well. That immigration occurred, uh, say, late, I'm going to say from the full of August, they probably, you know, uh, 1870s uh, into probably the early 1880s uh, and maybe 90s. But then the Black Seas really started settling more so, say, in the 1880s forward, uh, probably until about as late as 1910 or 1915. Um, by that time, things got harder to get out. Uh, and it really was uh, in part due to some of the things going on in Europe, uh, which led up to World War One. to be honest. Uh, so uh, they were settling, they were getting, getting established, they broke a lot of soil. Uh, and uh, then we had a stock market crash that occurred. Uh, many of these farmers had put money in the bank uh, only to lose all of their money uh, to that depression. Uh, they went. They went bankrupt essentially. Um, couldn't couldn't pay the bills and ultimately lost their farms. Some of those folks migrated out to out west uh, to California and other areas. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then in the 30s, we have the dirty 30s that came along, and that really uh, is all the way from Texas uh, to North Dakota and on even up into southern uh, Canada into the. Uh, into Saskatchewan and uh, Alberta area. Very hard on many, many farmers, many lost their farms again, that had survived the 29 crash. Uh, and, and that changed things again, and it certainly put people uh, in, in uh, a tough situation. Back in Russia, things weren't necessarily stable there either. You've got Nicholas II who comes to power. He happens to be the last czar that will ever come to power in Russia. Um, he obviously continues to push forward. Uh, his wife, again, was, I believe, a German. Um, but this was leading up to a period of time when, when there was a great deal of unrest in Russia. And ultimately, uh, he and his family are executed. Um, a pretty sad story if you've ever read any about that and in recent years they've actually found the mass grave where these uh, family was was killed uh, and buried. So that was somewhat of an end to a, a, a many generations of czars. And you have a guy coming in by the name of Lenin. Lenin obviously uh, had, had a, a communist approach to government, uh, government really controlling everything. And, and, and so those people that had not immigrated out of Russia that had stayed there, uh, there were many, still many Germans that never did immigrate. Uh, and they, they fell under the power of, of this. And so their lives were going to be changed by uh, this, this ideology, which are Leninism or Marxism. But also in that same period of time in the or 20s after, after the fall of, of Russia to, to the communism, you've got a, a guy who was a World War I veteran uh, for the German army and he becomes all more powerful as time goes on. Uh, Adolf Hitler was uh, certainly hard at work trying to, to do what he was going to do uh, that, that came about in the uh, in the late 30s and into the early 40s. Uh, was imprisoned at one point in time. I think you all know that he wrote a book called Mein Kampf. And that was really, I think, documenting his, his uh, background to some degree, but also spouting his ideology. So that timeline, uh, again, if we kind of look at it, you know, here we've got the Nazis, they come to power in 41, having done many things, uh, uh, you know, prior to that in, in Germany. Um, but then they also uh, overrun and conquer some of the parts of Volga area. They, they begin to, to deport those, those Germans uh, into different places. Some of the, these Germans in, ended up under the Russian army, obviously getting deported out and further to Siberia. But as, as Hitler continued on in his ways, um, 
what really happened there was that whole front essentially moved and it overtook the Black Sea area and ultimately that Volga area and they became uh, controlled by, by the uh, German uh, military during World War II. Um, but the, the Russians really were concerned about that. They were concerned that these Germans that had settled this area many decades prior to that were potentially turn against them. And so they took these, these, uh, these Germans and they, they pushed them further east, essentially into Siberia, some of them into Kazakhstan in that area. Um, gosh, I mean, some of those people, uh, they, they ended up in places like forests where they did forestry work. They were essentially sent into camps. Uh, many cases, the, the women that were married uh, were sent to one location with, with uh, the girls who weren't married and the men were sent to another area. Some of these men were also put into mines to do mining and so on. Very, very harsh life. Many of them did not survive. Um, some of them were just simply uh, killed because perhaps they were protesting or resisting and they were, um, they were not allowed to, to do what they chose and, and they were uh, executed one way or the other. There were many Germans that actually that were also executed even by the Nazis for fear that, the, that they were collaborating with the Russians against the Germans. So whichever, which, whichever way you were, you probably weren't safe. And that really became an, a big problem um, and, and continued on into certainly the 50s. And then uh, and by the 60s, you know, Khrushchev was in power and, and things became a little bit better. But even if you look at, at all of those things that, that happened, by 1974, there were 2 million uh, Germans living under the Soviet military uh, control, essentially. And here we have a bit of a look at that and some of the data. Um, obviously, you see some of the, the numbers of deaths and so on. I don't, I'll let you read those things for yourself. But I think it's safe to say that, that, uh, that by the time all was done with, uh, with, the, with the war, Second World War and so on, the Volga and the Black Sea areas were pretty much uh, void of any Germans. Uh, they were either, they had either been left the country and they'd gone to, to North America and South America, or they may have uh, gone to, to Siberia or so on as, as a forced settlement. They had been killed. They, they were brought into the military, many of them, uh, one way or the other, and they were often you know, killed in, in battle. And, and so the whole situation for them, from what they had hoped to have in early 1800s, uh, by the time we get to say 1945 or 50, had changed radically. And uh, so that's really a relatively short period of time for that much to happen to those people. So back when we talk a little bit about some of the stuff that was going on with the, the depression and the, the, and, and, uh, the, thir the dirty thirties, um, we have a situation where these people couldn't make a living on that prairie. And so they began to move further west. Um, they, I, I have found that many of the people that lived in say Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, many of those people moved to what I'll call Southern California. Uh, and those that moved, uh, that were from the Dakotas often moved to Northern California. A city uh, called Lodi was an area that uh, was completely inundated, I think by German, uh, German Russian immigrants, and they were now maybe first generation Americans uh, into that area. Some of them ended up working in the vineyards and so on. Uh, one, one name that I know uh, became a very successful wine, uh, winemaker and actually their own vineyards, uh, selling wine, I believe, to this day. Uh, others, others immigrated further north into Washington state um, and settling into areas where they could farm and uh, do things, particularly the Yakima Valley area of Washington. 
Some did, did uh, live in other areas all the way along that area. During the Second World War, certainly many people moved out that direction because there were all kinds of jobs and so on for, oh, think of Rosie the Riveter. You have many people from German uh, Russian heritage going out that direction. Um, prior to that, a little bit before that, I should say, <clears throat> Canada's became open and there were people, and particularly from some from North Dakota that had settled and homesteaded in North Dakota, chose to sell their land after they had it free and clear and moved to Canada. And they moved into that Alberta, Saskatchewan area. Um, I have relatives up there. Many people from the Dakotas will find that they have relatives up in that area. Um, it seems to uh, have been a, a big magnet. They could sell their property in, in the Dakotas uh, put their cattle or whatever on a train and they could work their way across uh, the border homestead up here again. And uh, and then they had all that money in their pocket to either buy more land or buy whatever they needed. Uh, my experience in talking to those farmers, many of them became very successful even to this day. So <clears throat> let's continue a little bit with Gorbachev. And most of us are probably old enough to remember him being in power and, and some of the things he did. Um, there was a large number of people, and again, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the, the, the statistics of how many people were living in Kazakhstan and Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, and, and even in Ukraine. But there were many people that were living in there that were of German heritage. Uh, ultimately, uh, we have something called glasnost that happens, and that makes some changes uh, for the better for many of these Germans who really wanted to get out. And it opens up uh, the, the country of Germany for them to come and settle. Um, many, many people came into that area. I had an opportunity at one time to be part of a, a, a group with from North Dakota State University, we actually went to Stuttgart and set up a booth where many of these immigrants were. And we were educating those people essentially on the fact that they might have relatives in the United States. And it was rather interesting to be talking this dialect of German to those people whose, whose first tongue, uh, mother tongue was Russian, but they were speaking about the same dialect of German that I was. Uh, most of them were rather amazed. It was a really uh, interesting and moving experience to do that. Um, I don't regret doing it a bit. I, I learned a lot. I was never able to keep in contact with any of them, but it was, it was really an enjoyable opportunity. So let's kind of think about where are they now? Um, we've talked about this. North America, well, certainly we talked about, um, you know, we've talked about Canada, we've talked about, um, you know, the United States and where they settled and, and so on. Um, some ended up going to South America at that same era, period of time. And one of the reasons that happened was those people that ended up in South America, either one chose to go there or when they came into the ports into the United States, they sometimes had a disease that was diagnosed and often it was something called pink eye. Today, we don't really think too much about it. It was very contagious. Back then they could be turned around and sent back to the port they came from. And typically those ports were in Germany. Um, and when they got there, they sometimes ended up catching a different boat and ended up in South America. So uh, families and sometimes would be allowed in, uh, in part, and then the balance of them would be sent back to uh, to Germany. They would get on a ship and go to South America. And those families may sometimes connect again with their uh, relatives in North America, but in many cases not. Uh, my experience is not so many Black Sea Germans ended up doing that, but many of Olga. And uh, there are numbers of people in the, uh, in the societies that have made contact with relatives of theirs uh, and in part, it's because of DNA and, and, and uh, people connecting that way. Germany comes into this picture because of Glasnost and the opening of, of the lands of Germany and allowing these people to become German citizens. And, um, and so there's, there's many people that have settled in that area. Some people did stay in Kazakhstan and Siberia. I've had 
Um, in recent months, I've had two occasions to connect with uh, people that are still living there and wanting to know more about their relatives in the United States. In recent, within the last month, in fact, a 22 year old uh, gal uh, from Siberia was interested and found my name somewhere, made contact with me and her English was extremely good. Uh, we communicated uh, by email and by, I think, well, just by email, but uh, um, I've provided her some information that now links um, her family to some of those that settled in the United States. Uh, most of those were from the Dakotas. So it's kind of exciting to have a 22 year old in Siberia uh, interested in her genealogy and doing this much. I, uh, I am gonna try and keep in contact with her. She is in planning to become a teacher, a school teacher actually is what her goal is and she's close to completing her education for that. So that's where all those people are at. I'm continuing on a little bit. Do you know anybody that's a German from Russia? Or do you think you don't know anybody? There's probably somebody on this next couple of pages you might know. Here we are. Guy on the left, Lawrence Welk, a North Dakota native. Um, he became a pretty successful band leader. He's a real showman and uh, did very well for himself. Um, his father, I believe, bought him the first used accordion um, and he really never wanted to be a farmer, but he became very successful. He's a, just a, uh, an interesting showman. Uh, he actually played at my grandfather's uh, barn as a barn dance. And so that's always been somewhat interesting to me. I also got to know his sister, his, his sister named Eva. Um, and when I was a college student, I happened to uh, be, be working in a situation where she came and needed, uh, needed my help and I was able to help her out. Uh, Angie Dickinson, I'm sure many of you know her from uh, television and, and the big screen. She was actually uh, born in North Dakota as well. John Denver, we remember him uh, uh, as, a, as a musician, uh, quite well known, I think mostly in the 70s, particularly. Um, there are other people that maybe are a little less known to all of us. Uh, Jonathan on the left, uh, well, uh, a very good skater, uh, Chicago Blackhawk, uh, but he's a ca Canadian. Fellow in the middle, middle, his name is Mettler. Became quite successful in, in, uh, in the, with Hughes Aircraft. Uh, his family line, I don't think it's him particularly, but his family line, they are the ones that I mentioned earlier that they had a wine and a, a vineyards. And so uh, I think you can actually find Mettler breweries in California. Never had any of their wine. Would like to try some someday, but I understand they've, they've done very well. Fellow on the right-hand side is probably one of those Dallas cowboy nemesis. His name is Carson Wentz. Uh, Carson Graduated from, um, from NDSU, uh, was a good football player there, came to Frisco at least two or three times playing in the big game uh, here, I think, in, what is it, January when they played those games. But anyway, uh, now plays for the Philadelphia Eagles, I believe. Um, in politics, we have a fellow on the left-hand side by the name of Tom Daschle. He originates out of Aberdeen, South Dakota. I've met him on a couple of occasions, I guess. Um, before he was, uh, in one case, before he was actually in any position in the uh, U.S. Congress. Um, and then later on when he was in Congress, I met him one more time. But uh, he actually is related to my, my wife's father. I think they were third cousins or our third cousins. Glenn Beck is uh, certainly a, a conservative political uh, commentator. I believe he even lives here in the Dallas area, although I don't know that for certain. A uh, fellow on the right hand side uh, was a musician again, a group called the Eagles, pretty popular group in I think the 80s. And then we have a uh, fellow on the left side, uh, Alan Newharth. Uh, Gladys, I know you're online here and and uh, you and Alan, I believe, are sec either first or second cousins, I forget which. But anyway, Alan uh, was Quite, he's had a, quite an interesting history. He lost his father at the age of eight. Uh, his mother ended up doing what she could to make ends meet 
Alan ended up being a paper boy, one of his first jobs. Uh, he went on to graduate from the University uh, of South Dakota, uh, ended up uh, owning and starting USA Today. Later on became the head of uh, Gannett. And if you're familiar with Gannett, they're a big organization even to this day that um, uh, it's been around. I had an opportunity to introduce him at one of the Germans from Russia Heritage conventions uh, as our keynote speaker. That was uh, pretty cool because um, we had been wanting to have him come speak for many years. Gladys helped me make that happen. And I'm still very appreciative. Um, Brian in the middle is another politician. He was the governor of, uh, I think it says here somewhere, uh, was it Montana? And then on the right-hand side, I guess I would call Philip more of a philanthropist. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, mixture of people. But then we can continue on with another musician, uh, Chris Isaac, who I think is still producing music and, and, and making records. Two astronauts. I want my picture to be one of those, but it didn't happen. But anyway, um, these two gentlemen uh, both have done a lot with, with our space program. Now we'll look a little bit at some of the females that we've seen. Uh, Cheryl Ladd actually is uh, from South Dakota, uh, graduated I think from here in high school and ended up in Hollywood. Uh, Carla Mont, I don't think she's the Miss uh, America right now. I think she's now past Miss America, but also in North Dakota. And uh, Ashley is, uh, is from uh, Nebraska originally. And uh, so is uh, Rebecca. Um, I'm just going to let you read a little bit about those. Talk a little bit more sports. Brian Erlocker has some Germans from Russia connections, as does uh, Haley in the center, uh, who is a, a gold medalist. Fellow on the right hand side, some of you might remember or know, uh, Josh Hypo was a very good quarterback for. Uh, some of the Texas college football teams. He was a quarterback. Um, he's from Aberdeen, South Dakota. Uh, I think I know his uncle. Um, I had met, worked with his uncle many years ago. And uh, now I believe he is coaching at uh, Central Florida University. I believe it is, is where he's located. Um, he had a short career in, in, in pro ball. I think he played for the... Uh, Chicago uh, Bears for a short period of time. These four people are, there's more people than four on here, but there's four of them in particular that are really special to me. Margaret Freeman, who was um, like an aunt to me. She uh, really is one of the founders of the, of the Gleekstall Colonies Research Association, along with Gwen Pritzkow. Uh, these two were really very good friends. They, they were friends and colleagues. And, and when you got the two of them together, oh boy, there was a lot of genealogy flying. Um, Art Flagel was a good friend of these ladies as well. Art was really the, probably the first German from Russia guy that I knew that ever, that had a tremendous amount of knowledge. The very first convention I attended, he looked at my at my surname, and he told me exactly which enclave in Russia my families were from, just by looking at my last name. Amazing man, uh, lived in, in California, but was born in North Dakota. Um, his, his family, I think, still has Flagel Furniture, which is in, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, but was very, very instrumental in getting many things done for, for the societies and getting things to happen. Uh, I lived to be 100 years old. He was an amazing man and wonderful singing voice. This lady here, uh, Ardell passed away a couple of years ago as well, and three years ago, I guess. And she was probably uh, as close to a sister as I'll ever have. She and I did a lot of genealogy together. She taught me a lot. And she's another one that was, I'd say, almost more like a sister than a aunt. But uh, passed away a couple of years ago, and I, I miss her every day. So kind of looking at it again, I think I talked a little bit about all these people and, and you see how they fit into the, the Germans from Russia history. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. And then you see really above all, these two individuals really um, made it happen 
for the Germans to uh, leave their homeland, go to Russia, and ultimately uh, many of them coming to, to the United States or Canada, South America, and so on. So just a little bit about uh, the organizations. They, you, I mentioned AHSGR, we talked about that. There's a, there are web links here, uh, uh, AHSGR, GRHS, as well as the Gleek style colonies. Um, there's many other areas of research that we could go into. Um, I'm on a board for yet another group that I didn't mention here uh, out of Galicia, which was an area before, uh, before all this came about. Um, if you wish to contact me, you can write my email address down and feel free to come back and ask questions or, or look for some information from me. I, I will be happy to do my best to, to help. Um, I do want to mention that there are two universities that are doing a lot for the Germans from Russia in trying to preserve the heritage. Uh, the, uh, the Germans from Russia heritage collection uh, has really uh, teamed up quite a bit with the Gleekstella colonies and that we now store our archives there at NDSU uh, so that other researchers, uh, either current researchers or future generation researchers, can find information about that heritage. But also the, the uh, school, uh, Northern State University is the name of it. it. They've got a subset called the South Dakota Germans from Russia collection. So a relatively new group starting up. I've been working a lot with them uh, and getting something going at the Beulah uh, Williams Library there on the campus of NDSU, or excuse me, uh, N NSU in Aberdeen, South Dakota. So those are two organizations that are doing a lot. There are a few other uh, universities uh, in, the, in the country. I believe there's one in Washington uh, for sure that, that has got a, quite a bit of information uh, as well. But there's my, my ad address. And I do wanna mention that some of this material that I've shown you is uh, copyrighted by the, the people that produced it. And the process of getting this ready, I, I wrote to those people getting permission to do this and to use this for this presentation. Uh, I don't mind if you have a look at it. I just ask that you don't copy it. So thank you. I don't wanna leave you with one other last thought. It, the, that one is right at the bottom. Uh, we don't know where we're going if we don't know where we came from. I think that's so true. Uh, many people in this world today maybe more so than ever. Uh, so many of them, if you talk to them, they don't know anything about their heritage, uh, or, you know, anything about what and where they came from. It's truly a, uh, a shame that they don't. Hopefully they, they come around and, and learn more as they go on, but it's important to understand our heritage and where we're from. Many people are now interested in their DNA. A little bit might help. And certainly genealogy is like a wonderful hobby uh, to have as you, uh, as you grow in years and you mature and you understand your history better. So thank you. And I think that's it for me. Wow, that was wonderful. Um, I don't know if we have any questions, but if anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask Dwayne um, any questions. That was awesome, thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Wayne, this is Bernard. You mentioned the, the company that had the ships like the Tsar Alexandria and whatever. From yeah, my reading, yeah. from Mitzvah. my reading, I understand that when they sent their agents into, I guess that was the Black Sea area, that it was possible for the Germans in Russia to buy a package that would cover all their travel, leaving right. Russia, getting across the Atlantic, settled in the States. Does that help in any way if you're trying to trace the ancestors in terms well, of the records? I've never, I've never found it to be, a, I've never found any records of uh, their train passenger trips. Uh, I give you, you know, we all, we all think of New York as, a, as one of the primary ports of entry. Uh, certainly before, before um, there was Ellis Island, uh, they were landing in, in the uh, state of New York and in the uh, very southern edge of, of Manhattan. And, um, uh, and then they would be taken directly from there over, or they had to make their way over to a, a, a ship, or not a ship, but a, a, a railroad line um, 
that that was in New Jersey, and then they would be taken east. And and I've never found any records, and I've never really heard anybody talking about those records and if they would be available. It's a great question, but yes, Metzler would actually they would arrange to have that <clears throat> entire higher um, uh, package there for them. And many of these people didn't have a great deal of money, that or they were too frugal. And so what they would often do is um, is they would buy a, a passenger uh, routes in what they call steerage, which was the very bottom of the ship, the lowest cost, and they would get their way over. It was about a two week, 10 day to two week trip over. And that was if they came from a place like Bremen um, and that was often in port. So they had to ha actually work their way from Russia up to Germany and then catch that uh, ship to get all the way back to, um, to the United States. Uh, and there were other, Metzler, Metzler was one, uh, probably the biggest one. I've, I'm sure there were probably comp competitors. I haven't really researched that. Uh, there are, there is a book called Ships of Our Ancestors that is excellent. It has photographs of all of these ships. Uh, so you can get a chance to see what, what those ships look like. And we have a question in the chat from Kathleen. How do the Swabian Germans fit into this picture? Swabian Germans, I am one. That, and the Swabian Germans were typically from that, uh, I'm going to say, um, Wittenberg area and that Black Forest region. They were part of the Black Sea Germans. And a lot of the, that, those people settled in that Black Sea region. I mentioned the, the Glickstall area, the Kuchagon area the Beresine, all of those people were uh, typically of the, uh, the Schwabians. Some of them were from an area from, if you know your, your geography a little bit of, of, of Germany, uh, if you know where Stuttgart is to the Northwest, uh, as you approach that a border between uh, Wittenberg and, and uh, what I call the Falz or uh, the Palatine area, some people came from that area as well. My mother's mother's side of the family came from that area, settling in the Barracine area in a village called Worms. Good question. How do the, now I'm gonna follow up on my own question. Uh, how do the, the people I'm familiar with uh, actually came from the Alsace-Lorraine uh, area uh, and then went and lived into the Swabian area and then Many of them went to, to Siberia, so after World War II. So I'm curious, uh, how, how was the emigration from um, Alsace-Lorraine? Are you asking me a question? Yeah, are, is it true that many of the people who went to the Schwabian area from Germany came from Alsace-Lorraine? More so, I think more so they were probably uh, the Alsace uh, region along that French German border certainly would have been more inclined to want to get out when, when Napoleon was pushing that uh, area pretty hard for, you know, lots of battles and all that type of thing. Um, that would have been an area they would have gotten out of. And certainly like in my, in my uh, looking at my wife's side of the family, my wife's as German Russian as I am, uh, but her family's come from the Kuchagon area. But when I go back further and look at some of that, they came from predominantly an area that was in probably um, just, I'm gonna say within 15 miles of that, that border. And that border moved around at different points in time, and different points of history. So that Elsus Lorraine region or the Elsus region, um, a lot of those people came in uh, into the Black Sea area, settling in, in predominantly probably the Kuchagon area uh, but there were other areas, like I mentioned, the, the Gross Liebenthal area, and even some in the Barracine. But uh, they typically, they, they, if you really look at the people, they, these enclaves were typically, uh, many cases, either Protestant or Catholic. And the church would be, be kind of that center point. Uh, uh, very important to them. Even in doing my, my genealogy, I'm looking at, at some of my wife's records or some of the other stuff. I'm finding that I don't really find very many intermarriages that are right. Uh, they're, they're really, we're pretty strict about that uh, religion perspective. That is actually a benefit when you're doing research. 
because some names, I'll give you a name, Wolf, W-O-L-F or W-O-L-F-F. You will find some that are in Catholic families and you'll find some that are Protestant, but typically you don't find that they are intermarried. And so you can know that those wolves probably came and uh, the ones that I'm thinking of came from that Elsus region. Uh, I have a family line of wolves that are Protestant and they came more from that Wittenberg area. Thank you. Can I answer your question? Yeah, thanks very much. This, this is Marlene. I just want to make a comment about the uh, Germans from Russia Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's, um, it's located about a couple blocks from our, where my daughter lives. And we went to the museum and it's really very interesting. So if anybody gets up to Lincoln, Nebraska, that would be a good place to stop. I agree with you. It's a good and excellent. It's an excellent place. I, I was there um, a year ago in July. And uh, um, I, I know quite a number of those people that work in there. Uh, I also know um, the past president of the society and who was, I actually had invited her to be on here. I don't know if she, she made it, but, uh, but a good organization. They have a nice museum, uh, gives you a real good feel for what things were like uh, for those Volga Germans, especially that settled in, in the uh, Nebraska area. It's not to say that HSGR doesn't touch on, on the Black Sea area. It's just that they have more information probably on the, on the Volga. Uh, and I would say the and vice versa, uh, Germans from Russia Heritage Society in Bismarck, they have a, a, a very good library. They don't have a museum as such, uh, but they have a good library. Uh, but their focus is probably, I would say, more on the Black Sea area. So there is where the, the, the differences are. It's one of the reasons that if you're a member of our society, you don't have to be a member of uh, locally and, and the, you don't have to be a member of both the national societies because your interests might lie more with one or the other. And that's the agreement we kind of had. Um, gosh, I, I helped negotiate that deal back when I lived in Minnesota quite a number of years ago for the chapter in Minnesota called the North Star Chapter of Minnesota. I was the president of that chapter many times too. So yeah, this stuff is kind of in my blood, pretty thick. <laughs> for the Alsace, sorry, this is Robin from Edmonton, Canada. For the Alsace-Lorraine question, there's actually, if you're willing to speak French or Latin, <laughs> There's actually the records from the parish records for the Alsace Lorraine that actually talk about and translate the um, parish records and some of the journals are available through the French government if you wanted to find out more on those. Well, as long as you can read French, is that correct? I call it drunkenese because it's German, French, and Latin, depending on when they wrote it and how they wrote it. It, it, it takes a bottle of wine and some quality time to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, and I'm, you know, I think uh, if anybody, this is just uh, popped into my head. I think I saw an email come through this morning. There's going to be uh, a class on how to read Cyrillic. So if you're getting into some of the Russian records themselves, rather than the German material, uh, there's going to be a class on how to help you get through some of the Cyrillic, which is a pretty tough language to figure out. I, I've, I've taken a crack at it and I don't get to first base. So um, that, that may be of interest. And if it is, you just contact me and I'll send you that email. Just to follow a up with Robin, um, when you say that are available through the French government, uh, what does that mean? Oh, um, the, the Bass Rin archives is the, the words to search for in Google. Um, I'm on my cell phone, so I can't go copy and paste it. But the, the Bass Rin archives or Etisseville, is from the French government and they actually have any records they could possibly digitalize. They have the original photos of the documents from the parish records and the civil records that were provided. So um, for specifically Alsace Lorraine, because that's my zone, um, it was uh, ET Civil uh, and then from the uh, GOUV.FR, I believe. But when you search those kind of words, it, it comes up and then um, you can search specifically by each colony. And it has the uh, civil and parish records and then the 
the uh, familysearch.org has done some translating and GRHS, they've got a, an amazing community in the background that have been doing translations like mad for quite a while. So they may have already done your records. Like I know read cells, I sent them a, a wish list when I found it. And they said, Hey guys, can I trade you this awesome resource I found? Please send me what you can read. And they've been doing it quite nicely. Cool. Thanks. No problem. I, I have a question about those records. Uh, if they're, obviously they're in French, are they predominantly, would they predominantly be for uh, Catholic records then? Do you know if that, I don't know of any Protestant rec, uh, churches and I don't know why, I don't, never really researched that either. Uh, um, but uh, I know uh, French were predominantly Catholic. You know, honestly, when it came down to it, um, my team was mostly Catholic, but when I looked for Protestant stuff, the weird angle I decided to take was um, looking at military pension records and the French government, I found it once or twice, but I can't remember exactly where. There's um, there's military records you can pull from the French and the German governments in the area. I would actually go by that. Okay. And then uh, the EWZ, if it's more modern, if you needed to. I apologize. I don't have much for Protestant. I've been hunting like mad for it myself. Dwayne? Yes. Uh, this is Steve Winning. Anyone, Steve? Just fine. I wanted to say thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to uh, watch this. I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot. Good. Uh, oh, I wow. have uh, half okay. of my uh, family is uh, Jangala, and they ended up in uh, on the Crimean Peninsula uh, around, I think, Zurichtal. And as near as I've been able to guess, I think they came out of Switzerland. Is that possible? That is possible. I'm, I've run across uh, different names that, that did that. Um, and, and, and here's my theory on all that, Steve. Um, in, during the Thirty Years' War, this was in the, in the, in the 1500s, actually, there were areas of, of uh, what well, let's say modern day Germany that were pretty much void of people uh, between the 30 years war that killed a lot of people uh, with all these different armies coming in and killed people. They were conscripted, taken away, whatever. Uh, and prior to that, just prior to that, not that long with the black plague. And between those two events, it wiped out a big population uh, area, that population, and so I believe that somewhere along the line, and I haven't found the records yet, that there was a, an opportunity for people to migrate out of uh, Switzerland up into Germany and probably gain, you know, gain some freedom, although they were probably still serfs. But I believe that's what happens. And, and you may be onto something there, Steve. It's, uh, I haven't been able to find any real good links. Uh, I actually, one of my lines... Uh, that lived in the faults, I believe, might be from Switzerland as well, because other people that moved to Russia, when I've looked at their lines, I was actually able to find them all the way back down into Switzerland. So oh. the pop probability is there. Um, and uh, the, the finding the records and, and validating you know, that is where I'm still working on it. Okay. Well, if you ever find anything that you can tip me off on, uh, I'm all ears. I probably would write an article if I could find something, or I would share the article. Okay. Because yeah, it, it would be pretty, I think, a very good breakthrough. Uh, but I've never actually seen or heard anyone with that information to a degree. But you remember, we're talking 1500s in that area, 1600s, uh, kind of early for many people to even read. So unless the churches would record that, that's probably where you find it. And that's what's interesting about these Elsass records is that they might actually have information that might kind of go back to it that might give us, us a clue as to how to find some of that. Ah, okay. Well, this has been very interesting. Thank you for letting me know about this. You're welcome. Glad I could do something to help anybody. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Roger Meinart has some books on using the German references specifically. I don't know if they'll have Swedish breakout, but he does translation of older style German that might be able to help. And that's, uh, I'm just trying to grab the link. I'll throw it in the chat window. 
Are, is, this is, just, is this the German script you're thinking of? Uh, no, he's got some research guides on how to pull out of uh, non-Germany German records, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. And I was just going to grab the link for those in a sec. Okay. Does anybody else have a, a question or something they'd like to, to talk about with Dwayne? My, my, my time is yours. <laughs> well, well, we'll give Robin a minute to post that in the chat here so we won't uh, go away or anything. Oh, she did. Okay. Sorry, it's up. <laughs> I was just trying to find the exact book, but it'll take me a sec. It's all good. Sorry about that, guys. No, that's fine. Well, you know, I, one thing I want to say is any of those of you that are in the Dallas area and you wish to uh, get to know more about our group, um, feel free to contact me. I will ha be happy to do that. Um, I might take your name and pass it on to our uh, VP of membership. She can provide you more information on some of those details than I can, but uh, I will do my best. And even if you if you don't want to join the organization, you just have some questions. You know, you've got my email. I was in the presentation somewhere. Uh, feel free to contact me. I, I will do my best to help you. You want to give your email one more time? Um, sure. Um, well, hang on. Let's see if I can just bring. Is my is my presentation still on the screen? Yes, it is. Yes. If you just put, if you go to the last slide, I think it had your email address. Yeah, that's what I got to get to. I'm still in presentation mode and it takes a little bit. There it is. Right there. Hey, okay, great. Wow. It was just really great. We had several comments in chat about how, how, how appreciative everybody was of, of you doing this and it is wonderful. <laughs> it was I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. I, mean, I, I have given this presentation to our local HOA one time, but it was a more of an abbreviated version. Um, I, I've expanded this one a bit uh, to include more information, uh, particularly uh, I'm very interested actually in trying to learn more about those Texans that settled in, uh, you know, the Germans from Russia that settled in Texas, that became Texans. Uh, I would like to learn more about them um, and a little bit about what, you know, where they, their heritage came from. Where, were they Black Sea? Were they Volga? Where did they, where did they originate from? And I haven't really found anybody to that point. I have made contact with one uh, lady who uh, has a heritage, her Mennonite heritage, and those Mennonites settled in West Texas and I think there's a fairly good community there of, of them that live in one general area. Um, and, um, and they have, they have moved around several locations at one point in time, that group was actually living in Mexico. And then they came back to the United States living in Texas. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting to try and understand where all these folks are from and, and where, when you trace it back where they came from. Mm -hmm. And so what I just put in chat uh, to remind people, this is being recorded, so you can listen to it again. And um, it's gonna take a few days for them to process the video and post it. But the website, um, it'll be on um, the Dallas Genealogy Society's German Interest Group page that I just um, posted. And again, if you go to that website, you'll see the, the, the applications for membership to the organizations that Dwayne spoke about. Well, if nobody has anything else. I do real quick. Sure. This is Kay Fritzler. Um, I'm with the, the North Dallas group and I want any of you who are thinking about or are already members that your librarian hasn't been just hanging out this year. I've upped our game a little bit. I have more titles in our library. Um, my husband, who is a computer guy, has been trying to organize everything uh, in a better way to connect our library with the one in Lincoln and, and North Dakota. So there's better referencing. But 
besides that, uh, I have a question, Dwayne, and that's for those of us who uh, were the generation who didn't get to learn our language. Is there any chance that there could be any of that kind of thing? I have a book, it's from the North Dakota Germans and it's um, Let's Speak German, no, Let's Speak Russian German or so. It's a fun yeah. book, mm -hmm. but I would, I'd be very, very interested in uh, taking a class to learn a little bit more. You know, uh, I'm one of those that could understand a lot of it and couldn't say it. And, uh, you know, I have the recipes, I have the, the food words, but I don't have conversational things. Well, we got we got to invite Steve down here. He, he Steve Weniger probably knows German. Uh, at least he probably knows it better than any of us. Verstehe ich mich, wann ich das sag? Yeah, ich verstehe. Good. <laughs> the, the, the dialect, the dialect that, that Steve and I actually just said, and, and, and much of it is going to be understood uh, by, you know, even the other Germans, but there's a lot of different dialects of German. Um, the ones that, that we know probably, and, and Steve grew up, uh, Steve and I are friends. We're, we're, we're friends and, and uh, we, we played cards together in Minnesota a few times. Anyway, um, uh, that's just, that's Schwabisch or Schwaben. And, and um, if you go into that Black Sea area or Black Forest area and, and then out there toward the Stuttgart area, you still hear it spoken. Uh, but if you get into other parts of Germany, not so much. So the, the real challenge is to find a, a teacher that can teach that dialect, uh, if that's what you're looking for. If you're just looking to read it, it it's the same. I think it's pretty close to the same. Um, no, I'm looking to be able to at least say a few things to my grandchildren, you know. Okay. Um, we were Volga. Um, I only have one uncle left. Uh, he's 89, you know, and so, uh, and he was the youngest, so he has less uh, ability to speak. So, you know, I'm just looking. Do you know, do you know what dialect your Volga family spoke? Have no idea. They just were yeah. from Grimm yeah. and they spoke Grimm. German. That's mm -hmm. all. That's yeah, I, I mean, there's there's another another version that uh, that is familiar uh, or sometimes heard of. It's called Plattdeutsch. Yeah, and, my dad Platt, talked about that. Yeah, Plattdeutsch might be the dialect that you might be thinking about. Um, that I think Plattdeutsch comes from meaning more or less being kind of the flatlands or the lowlands of right. Germany. And um, I I don't know how different it is. I guess I've never really explored that. Um, uh, yeah, we're, I, I'm going to keep it in mind. That's a okay. good question. You're of, uh, you're of no help right now, but thank you for uh, keeping it in mind. I appreciate it. Anybody else out there? Um, I'd love to get together and try and figure some of it out. Just a few things, you know, just. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly willing to give you uh, some help if I can. Um, you know, yeah. we could arrange to even just talk on the telephone since we're, we're kind of stuck to these virtual, virtual things nowadays. Uh, yeah. we could, I can maybe certainly I can uh, help you with a little bit. I have, I have to look at my, I've, I've got behind me, you see a couple of bookcases. I've got a couple more on the other side over here and they're all stuffed full of books. And most of them are Germans from Russia related. Um, but I have, a, I have a, maybe two or three uh, primers that are called primers and be what you, would you learn uh, in German in the first grade, and maybe the thing to do would be use those as the written part of it, but then maybe hear what those words sound like when you say them in mm -hmm. German. And that yeah, might okay. Although it might be words like cat and dog and stuff, it's not going to be. Yeah. You know, things that well, I picked up the babble thing, and you know, I that's really easy, but that's really not what my dad sounded like. So, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I mean, if I. Yeah, I don't know of anybody that's actually doing anything. You know, what I could think of is uh, almost a primer on how to say certain words and maybe yeah. Yeah. and, and uh, uh, put something together like that. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't feel I speak it well enough to do it, but I know what you're wanting. Okay. Bring her along up to Minnesota. We'll teach her. Well, well I've got grandkids in Wisconsin. Maybe I'll just head on over to Minnesota. Well, that's close enough for government work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll get on, on the other hand, Steve, it's 74 degrees here. Maybe you'd like it down here better. <laughs> hey, Thank actually, you, today I think we almost hit 70. Wow, that's great. 
we got to enjoy it. It's not going to last long. This is true. Monday, mm -hmm. it's all over, I guess. Uh oh. No, for free, Roma Vidal. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions? Well, all I can say is thank you so much. Um, and again, this is recorded and they'll take off some of the fluff in the front and whatever um, as they um, post it. But um, I appreciate everybody attending and hope you come back and visit us. Sounds great. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. If you're not a member, please consider joining now by going to DallasGenealogy.com and clicking on the membership tab. Your membership dues will help us support the genealogy section of the Dallas Public Library and that will allow us to continue our education and preservation efforts.